last day of September. We now have Hurricane Joaquin. This now with winds of 75 miles per hour. Hurricane Joaquin strengthening is now a Category 3. Category 4 hurricane. It has formed across the Bahamas. This has been a really problematic hurricane. 28 Americans are missing, along with five Polish sailors, all of them aboard a cargo ship that has been caught in Hurricane Joaquin. We covered 70,000 square nautical miles uh, yesterday, looking through the El Faro. Federal investigators head to Jacksonville, Florida this morning to investigate the sinking of the American cargo ship El Faro. Today we meet in open session as required by the government and the Sunshine Act to consider the sinking of the cargo ship El Faro in the Atlantic Ocean northeast of Acklands and Crooked Island, Bahamas, on October the 1st, 2015. And please understand that the sole purpose of our investigation is to find out what happened so that it does not happen again. In late September of 2015, a tropical storm was strengthening into what would become Hurricane Joaquin, producing winds up to 155 miles an hour. Days earlier, El Faro and its crew departed its home port of Jacksonville, Florida on an 1100 nautical mile planned voyage to San Juan, Puerto Rico. After nearing the eye wall of the hurricane, the ship sank in the Atlantic Ocean near the Bahamas claiming the lives of all 33 crew members. Four days after the sinking, board member Bella Dinzar responded to the media on the Jacksonville Pier, ensuring the public that the NTSB would launch a comprehensive investigation. It turned out to be one of the most challenging and resource-intensive investigations the NTSB has ever undertaken. The NTSB is an independent federal agency charged by Congress to investigate transportation accidents, determine the probable cause, and issue safety recommendations to prevent the reoccurrence of those accidents. Each year, the NTSB investigates over 30 maritime accidents, and the sinking of the El Faro was the deadliest accident in over 30 years. The director of the NTSB Office of Marine Safety is Brian Curtis. It was his team of investigators that would grapple with the challenges presented by an accident site almost three miles underwater. The investigation actually proceeded down two tracks. Initially, we went on scene. We're conducting uh, interviews to conduct, to collect perishable data, interview company personnel, Coast Guard personnel, anybody that had anything to do with the vessel. The second track, of course, was we needed to recover the VDR. We knew the criticality of it. And so we, on a parallel uh, path, we will work to work out the logistics and plan to recover that BDR. 40 gallons before you break it open to the section. What, what Investigators then began collecting documents that were available, which led to interviews of friends and family of crew members, employees of tote services who operated El Faro, officials with the U.S. Coast Guard, American Bureau of Shipping, the National Weather Service, and anyone else with information that could help the investigators understand the condition of the vessel and information about the crew and the weather they encountered. To better understand the systems and configuration of El Faro, investigators boarded and surveyed El Yunque, a similar vessel constructed by the same shipbuilder. Within weeks, the U.S. Coast Guard convened the first of three Marine Boards of Investigation. At these hearings, Coast Guard and NTSB investigators interviewed dozens of individuals who could shed light on numerous aspects of TOTE's operations, the crew members' history, training, and background, and procedures for voyage planning and navigating in heavy weather conditions. NTSB investigators analyzed the information they gathered in the hope that the VDR, which contained navigational data and, most importantly, an audio recording from the ship's bridge, could help them better understand just how El Faro ended up in such peril. The investigator in charge, or IIC, was Brian Young, 
who led a team of specialists that gathered and analyzed the many sources of information that were used to determine what happened to El Faro. The weather was a significant factor in this accident, but throughout the investigation, we also identified several other areas which we labeled as safety issues. Some of the issues were the captain's decision and his decision making regarding the ship heading towards and into the hurricane, the loss of propulsion, the bridge resource management, the securement of cargo, the stability of the vessel and damage stability issues. And the other item we looked into was the survival craft on board the vessel. Throughout the investigation, our investigators attended and contributed to several Coast Guard Marine Board investigation hearings. And we also conducted dozens and dozens of interviews. But we found the more interviews and the more hearings we went to and conducted, that we actually ended up with more questions than answers. The most important piece of evidence that we utilized was the VDR. That gave us 26 hours of parametric data as well as audio from the bridge. The NTSB contacted the U.S. Navy for assistance in recovering the VDR. Within weeks, the Navy ship Apache was proceeding towards the accident site in the Atlantic Ocean. Using sonar equipment, investigators listened for several days for the VDR acoustic beacon but heard nothing. So the team deployed Orion, a tethered underwater vehicle equipped with side-scan sonar. Four days later, investigators located a large target of interest and deployed a remotely operated underwater vehicle, Curve 21. With it, investigators positively identified the wreck of El Faro, which lay at a depth of more than 15,000 feet. But what the team saw surprised them. The two top decks of the superstructure, including the navigation bridge, mast, and VDR, were missing. Although the missing decks were located within several days, neither the mast nor the VDR that was mounted to it were anywhere to be found. Although investigators were not able to locate the VDR, much was accomplished during their three weeks at the accident site, including extensive photo and video documentation of the wreckage field, which would prove crucial in the effort to locate and recover the VDR. Back at the NTSB lab in Washington, investigators used the Curve 21's video footage and other information to narrow the search by calculating the likely trajectory of where the mast and VDR might have come to rest on the ocean floor. With this resource, the High Probability Search Zone, and the assistance of the National Science Foundation, the NTSB launched a second mission with the research vessel Atlantis, the autonomous underwater vehicle Sentry, and a telepresence that allowed investigators at NTSB headquarters in Washington to view data and video from the seafloor in real time. NTSB's Office of Marine Safety Investigator Eric Stolzenberg was the team leader aboard the Atlantis when the VDR was found. The second mission was to find the VDR on the Woods Hole vessel Atlantis. Part of that mission was also to map the debris field and to examine the wreckage to produce an image of the hull. We did find the VDR attached to the mast. Couldn't bring it up on that at that depth with the equipment on board, scheduled for that for another mission. But we were successful in producing an unprecedented debris field map, distances, the equipment found, over 40,000 photographs were examined. This was used to forensically validate some of our theories on how the vessel sank. The team detected more than 200 targets of interest in the search zone. Using an underwater observation vehicle, they obtained close-up video and images of those targets. One of those targets turned out to be the El Faro's mast, and attached to it was the VDR. Although the VDR appeared to be in fair condition, it was entangled, ruling out a recovery with the equipment that was available on Atlantis. The team decided to leave the VDR in place and return to the site later. A third mission, this one just to recover the VDR, was launched four months later with the U.S. Navy ship Apache and Curve 21. At just before 8 p.m. on August 8, 2016, the VDR capsule was freed from the mast and brought to the surface, 
more than 10 months after El Faro went down. What information are you hoping to find in the ER? Well, it, it would contain two things. First of all, navigational data of uh, inputs from the GPS, the radar, uh, maybe uh, possibly anemometer. We're not sure what was input, but it would supply some uh, navigational data. Additionally, it uh, is required to contain at least 12 hours of audio on the bridge, and that's it may contain more depending on the memory size, but certainly uh, uh, investigatively that would be an asset to know uh, what was going on on the bridge and the conversations they had. Once the VDR was recovered, investigators carefully dismantled its components. The NTSB successfully downloaded the voyage data and audio recordings from the navigation bridge of the Alfaro. The entire 26-hour recording was reviewed many times, with some statements reviewed more than a hundred times to ensure the transcription group understood what was being said. The 10 hours of audio that were determined to be relevant to the investigation were transcribed into a document which ran more than 500 pages and required more than 1,100 work hours to complete. It was the longest transcript of any recording ever produced by the NTSB. Federal investigators just released 500 pages of an audio recording recovered from the El Faro. In those transcripts, crew members urged the captain to change course, but as we all know, he did not do that. All 33 crew members, including the captain, perished in the disaster. Information from the VDR covered the final 26 hours of the voyage. The data ended at the approximate time of the sinking, and the last recorded position was very near where the wreckage of the ship was found. There were several independent sources of position tracking data for the ship and all are in, in agreement. So we have a high degree of confidence in the actual position of the El Faro throughout its voyage. So when the board's determination of the probable cause, there are three big takeaways. First, the captain's insufficient action to avoid Hurricane Joaquin in the first place. Secondly, his failure to use the onboard weather information available to him and thirdly, his late decision to muster the crew. You know, there are several other uh, contributing factors to the probable cause beyond that, but those are the three primary takeaways. In December 2017, the NTSB announced that it had identified 11 safety issues from which it made a total of 63 recommendations, ending a 26-month-long investigation of one of the worst maritime accidents in recent history. The recommendations adopted by the NTSB will enhance the safety of mariners at sea. They include improving tropical cyclone forecasting, storm advisories, and weather dissemination systems, ensuring that critical machinery can operate even when the ship is rolling or severely listing in heavy seas, equipping all ships with enclosed lifeboats and personal locator beacons for crew members, providing electronic indicators so crew members will know if a hatch is open or closed, requiring that life-saving appliances be periodically reviewed and updated to meet future requirements. And the list goes on. There's much more in our 16-page Illustrated Digest, which summarizes the key findings of the NTSB's accident report. The SS El Faro, unfortunately, is no longer with us, nor is the crew that she had with her on that final voyage. They're gone, but as they say, certainly not forgotten. And we hope that this tragedy at sea can serve as the lighthouse to guide the safety of marine transportation. We stand adjourned. Thank you.